Sisters and Brothers of America. It fills my heart with joy unspeakable to rise in response to the warm and cordial welcome which you have given us. I thank you in the name of the most ancient order of monks in the world. I thank you in the name of the mother of religions and I thank you in the name of millions and millions of Hindu people of all classes and sects. My thanks also to some of the speakers on this platform who, referring to the delegates from the Orient, have told you that these men from far off nations may well claim the honor of bearing to different lands the idea of toleration. I am proud to belong to a religion which has taught the world both tolerance and universal acceptance. We believe not only in universal toleration, but we accept all religions as true. I am proud to belong to a nation which has sheltered the persecuted and the refugees of all religions and all nations of the earth. I am proud to tell you that we have gathered in our bosom the purest remnant of the Israelites who came to southern India and took refuge with us in the very year in which their holy temple was shattered to pieces by Roman tyranny. I am proud to belong to the religion which has sheltered and is still fostering the remnant of the grand Zoroastrian nation. I will quote to you, brethren, a few lines from a hymn which I remember to have repeated for my earliest boyhood and which is every day repeated by millions of human beings. As the different streams, having their sources in different places, all mingle their water in the sea. So, O Lord, the different paths which men take through different tendencies, various though they appear, crooked or straight, all lead to Thee. The present convention, which is one of the most august assemblies ever held, is in itself a vindication, a declaration to the world of the wonderful doctrine preached in the Gita. Whoever comes to me, through whatsoever form I reach them, all are struggling through paths which in the end lead to me. Sectarianism, bigotry and its horrible descendant Fanaticism have long possessed this beautiful earth. They have filled the earth with violence, drenched it often and often with human blood, destroyed civilization and sent whole nations to despair. Had it not been for these horrible demons, human society would be far more advanced than it is now. But their time is come and I fervently hope that the bell that tolled this morning in honor of this convention may be the death knell of all fanaticism, of all persecutions with the sword or with the pen, and of all uncharitable feelings between persons wending their way to the same goal. पास में बंदे मैं तो तेरे पास में 
मैं तो तेरे पास में बंदे मैं तो तेरे पास ना तेरथ में ना मोरथ में ना तेरथ में ना मोरथ में ना एकांत निवास में ना मंदिर में ना मस्जिद में I will tell you a little story. You have heard the eloquent speaker who has just finished say, "Let us cease from abusing each other." And he was very sorry that there should be always so much of variance. But I think I should tell you a story that would illustrate the cause of this variance a frog lived in a well it had lived there for a very long time it was born there and brought up there and yet was a little small frog of course 
the evolutionists were not there then to tell us whether the frog lost its eyes or not but for our story's sake we must take it for granted that it had its eyes and that it every day cleansed the water of all the worms and bacilli that lived in it with an energy that would do credit to our modern bacteriologists in this way it went on and became a little sleek and fat well one day another frog that lived in the sea came and fell into the well where are you from i am from the sea the sea how big is that is it as big as my well and he took a leap from one side of the well to the other my friend said the frog of the sea how do you compare the sea with your little well then the frog took another leap and asked is your sea so big what nonsense you speak to compare the sea with your well well then said the frog of the well nothing can be bigger than my well there can be nothing bigger than this this fellow is a liar so turn him out that has been the difficulty all the while i am a hindu i am sitting in my own little well and thinking that the whole world is my little well the christians sit in their little well and think the whole world is their well the muslims sit in their little well and think that is the whole world i have to thank you of america for the great attempt you are making to break down the barriers of this little world of ours and hope that in the future the lord will help you accomplish your purpose स्वती नमो स्तुते चारदे विद्या प्रदे सरस्वती नमो स्तुते चारदे विद्या प्रदे सरस्वती नमो स्तुते चारदे विद्या प्रदे सरस्वती Sarah 
Three religions now stand in the world which have come down to us from time prehistoric Hinduism Zoroastrianism and Judaism They have all received tremendous shocks and all of them prove by their survival their internal strength But while Judaism failed to absorb Christianity and was driven out of its place of birth by its all conquering daughter and a handful of Parsis is all that remains to tell the tale of their grand religion sect after sect arose in India and seemed to shake the religion of the Vedas to its very foundations but like the waters of the sea shore in a tremendous earthquake it receded only for a while only to return in all absorbing hood a thousand times more vigorous and when the tumult of the rush was over these sex were all sucked in absorbed and assimilated into the immense body of the mother faith from the high spiritual flights of the vedanta philosophy of which the latest discoveries of science seem like echoes to the low ideas of idolatry and its multifarious mythology the agnosticism of the buddhists and the atheism of the jains each and all have a place in the hindu's religion where then the question arises where is the common center to which all these widely diverging radii converge where is the common basis upon which all these seemingly hopeless contradictions rest and this is the question i shall attempt to answer the hindus have received their religion through revelation the vedas 
they hold that the vedas are without beginning and without end it may sound ludicrous to this audience how a book can be without a beginning or end but by the vedas no books are meant they mean the accumulated treasury of spiritual laws discovered by different persons in different times just as the law of gravitation existed before its discovery and would exist if all humanity forgot it so is it with the laws that govern the spiritual relations between soul and soul and between individual spirits and the father of all spirits were there before their discovery and would remain even if we forgot them the discoverers of these laws are called rishis and we honor them as perfected beings i am glad to tell this audience that some of the very greatest of them were women here it may be said that these laws as laws may be without end but they must have had a beginning the vedas teach us that creation is without a beginning or end science is said to have proved that the sum total of cosmic energy is always the same then if there was a time when nothing existed where was all this manifested energy some say it was in a potential form in god in that case god is sometimes potential and sometimes kinetic which would make him mutable everything mutable is a compound and everything compound must undergo that change which is called destruction so god would die which is absurd therefore there never was a time when there was no creation if i may be allowed to use a simile creation and creator are two lines without beginning and without end zoning parallel to each other god is the ever active providence by whose power systems after systems are being evolved out of chaos made to run for a time and again destroyed this is what the brahmin boy repeats every day the sun and the moon the lord created like the suns and the moons of previous cycles and this agrees with modern science here i stand and if i shut my eyes and try to conceive my existence i i i what is the idea before me the idea of a body am i then nothing but a combination of material substances the vedas declare no i am a spirit living in a body i am not the body the body will die but i shall not die here i am in this body it will fall but shall go on living i had also a past the soul was not created for creation means a combination which means a certain future dissolution if then the soul was created it must die some are born happy enjoy perfect health with beautiful body 
mental vigor and all wants supplied others are born miserable some are without hands or feet others again are idiots and only drag on a wretched existence why if they are all created why does a just and merciful god create one happy and another unhappy why is he so partial nor would it mend matters in the least to hold that those who are miserable in this life will be happy in another one why should a man be miserable even here in the reign of a just and merciful god in the second place the idea of a creator god does not explain the anomaly but simply expresses the cruel rat of an all powerful being there must have been causes then before his birth to make a man miserable or happy and those were his past actions are not all the tendencies of the mind and the body accounted for by inherited aptitude here are two parallel lines of existence one of the mind the other of matter if matter and its transformations answer for all that we have there is no necessity for supposing the existence of a soul but it cannot be proved that thought has been evolved out of matter and if a philosophical monoism is inevitable spiritual monoism is certainly logical and no less desirable than a materialistic monoism but neither of these is necessary here we cannot deny that bodies acquire certain tendencies from heredity but those tendencies only mean the physical configuration through which a peculiar mind alone can act in a peculiar way there are other tendencies peculiar to a soul caused by his past actions and a soul with a certain tendency would by the laws of affinity take birth in a body which is the fittest instrument for the display of that tendency this is in accord with science for science wants to explain everything by habit and habit is got through repetitions so repetitions are necessary to explain the natural habits of a newborn soul and since they were not obtained in this present life they must have come down from past lives there is another suggestion taking all these for granted how is that that i do not remember anything of my past life this can be easily explained i am now speaking english this is not my mother tongue in fact no words of my mother tongue are now present in my consciousness but let me try to bring them up and the russian that shows that consciousness is only the surface of mental ocean and within its depths are stored up all our experiences try and struggle 
they would come up and you would be conscious even of your past life this is direct and demonstrative evidence verification is the perfect proof of a theory and here is the challenge thrown to the world by the rishis we have discovered the secret by which the very depths of the ocean of memory can be stirred up try it and you will get a complete reminiscence of your past life so then the hindu believes that he is a spirit him the sword cannot pierce him the fire cannot burn him the water cannot melt him the air cannot dry the hindu believes that every soul is a circle whose circumference is nowhere but whose center is located in the body and that death means the change of the center from holy to body nor is the soul bound by the conditions of matter in its very essence it is free unbounded holy pure and perfect but somehow or the other it find itself tied down to matter and thinks of itself as matter why should the free perfect and pure be thus under the thraldom of matter is the next question how can the perfect soul be deluded into the belief that it is imperfect we have been told that the hindus shirk the question and say that no such question can be there some thinkers want to answer it by positing one or more quasi perfect beings and use big scientific names to fill up the gap but naming is not explaining the question remains the same how can the perfect become the quasi perfect how can the pure the absolute change even a microscopic particle of its nature but the hindu is sincere he does not want to take shelter under sophistry he is brave enough to face the question in a manly fashion and his answer is i do not know i do not know how the perfect being the soul came to think of itself as imperfect as joined to and conditioned by matter but the fact is a fact for all that it is a fact in everybody's consciousness that one thinks of oneself as the body the hindu does not attempt to explain why one thinks one is the body the answer that it is the will of god is no explanation this is nothing more than what the hindu says i do not know well then the human soul is eternal and immortal perfect and infinite and death means only a change of center from one body to another the present is determined by our past actions and the future by the present the soul will go on evolving up or reverting back from birth to birth 
and death to death but here is another question is man a tiny boat in a tempest raised one moment on the foamy crest of a billow and dashed down into the yawning chasm the next rolling to and from at the mercy of good and bad actions a powerless helpless wreck in an ever raging ever rushing uncompromising current of cause and effect a little moth placed under the wheel of causation which rolls on crushing everything in its way and waits not for the widow's tears or the orphan's cry the heart sinks at the idea yet this is the law of nature is there no hope is there no escape was the cry that went up from the bottom of the heart of despair it reached the throne of mercy and words of hope and consolation came down and inspired a vedic sage and he stood up before the world and in trumpet voice proclaimed the glad tidings hear ye children of immortal bliss even ye that reside in higher spheres i have found the ancient one who is beyond all darkness all delusion knowing him alone you shall be saved from death over again children of immortal bliss what a sweet what a hopeful name allow me to call you brethren by that sweet name as of immortal bliss yea the hindu refuses to call you sinners we are the children of god the sharers of immortal bliss holy and perfect beings divinities on earth sinners it is a sin to call a man so it is standing liable on human nature come up o lions and shake off the delusion that you are sheep you are souls immortal spirits free blessed and eternal ye are not matter ye are not bodies matter is your servant not you the servant of matter thus it is that the vedas proclaim not a dreadful combination of unforgiving laws not an endless prison of cause and effect but that at the head of all these laws in and through every particle of matter and force stands one by whose command the wind blows the fire burns and the clouds rain and death stalks upon the earth and what is his nature he is everywhere the pure and formless one the almighty and the all merciful thou art our father thou art our mother thou art our beloved friend thou art the source of all strength give us strength thou art he that beareth the burdens of the universe help me bear the little burden of this life thus sang the rishis of the vedas and how to worship him through love he is to be worshiped as the one beloved 
dearer than everything in this and the next life. This is the doctrine of love declared in the Vedas. And let us see how it is fully developed and taught by Krishna, whom the Hindus believe to have been God incarnate on earth. He taught that a man ought to live in this world like a lotus leaf, which grows in water but is never moistened by water. So a man ought to live in the world, his heart to God and his hands to work. It is good to love God for hope of reward in this or the next world, but it is better to love God for love's sake. And the prayer goes, Lord, I do not want wealth, nor children, nor learning. If it be thy will, I shall go from birth to birth, but grant me this, that I may love thee without the hope of reward. Love unselfishly for love's sake. One of the disciples of Krishna, the then emperor of India, was driven from his kingdom by his enemies and had to take shelter with his queen in a forest in the Himalayas. And there one day the queen asked how it was that he, the most virtuous of men, should suffer so much misery. Yudhishthira answered, Behold, my queen, the Himalayas, how grand and beautiful they are. I love them. They do not give me anything, but my nature is to love the grand, the beautiful. Therefore, I love them. Similarly, I love the Lord. He is the source of all beauty, of all sublimity. He is the only object to be loved. My nature is to love Him and therefore I love. I do not pray for anything. I do not ask for anything. Let Him place me wherever He likes. I must love Him for love's sake. I cannot trade in love. The Vedas teach that the soul is divine, only held in the bondage of matter. Perfection will be reached when this bond will burst. And the word they use for it is therefore mukti, freedom. Freedom from the bonds of imperfection. Freedom from death and misery. And this bondage can only fall off through the mercy of God. And this mercy comes on the pure. So your purity is the condition of His mercy. How does that mercy act? He reveals Himself to the pure heart. The pure and the stainless see God, yea, even in this life. Then and then only, all the crookedness of the heart is made straight. Then all doubt ceases. He is no more the freak of a terrible law of causation. This is the very center, the very vital conception of Hinduism. The Hindu does not want to live upon words and theories. If there are existences beyond the ordinary sensuous existence, he wants to come face to face with them. If there is a soul in him which is not matter, 
if there is an all merciful universal soul he will go to him direct he must see him and that alone can destroy all doubts so the best proof a hindu sage gives about the soul about god is i have seen the soul i have seen god and that is the only condition of perfection the hindu religion does not consist in struggles and attempts to believe a certain doctrine or dogma but in realizing not in believing but in being and becoming thus the whole object of their system is by constant struggle to become perfect to become divine to reach god and see god and this reaching god seeing god becoming perfect even as the father in heaven is perfect constitutes the religion of the hindus and what becomes of a man when he attains perfection he lives a life of bliss infinite he enjoys infinite and perfect bliss having obtained the only thing in which man ought to have pleasure namely god and enjoys the bliss with god so far all the hindus are agreed this is the common religion of all the sects of india but then perfection is absolute and the absolute cannot be two or three it cannot have any qualities it cannot be individual and so when a soul becomes perfect and absolute it must become one with brahman and it would only realize the lord as the perfection the reality of its own nature and existence the existence absolute knowledge absolute and bliss absolute we have often and often read this called the losing of individuality and becoming a stock or a stone he just set scars that never felt a wound i tell you it is nothing of the kind if it is happiness to enjoy the consciousness of this small body it must be greater happiness to enjoy the consciousness of two bodies the measure of happiness increasing with the consciousness of an increasing number of bodies the aim the ultimate of happiness being reached when it would become a universal consciousness therefore to gain this infinite universal individuality this miserable little prison individuality must go then alone can death cease when i am one with life then alone can misery cease when i am one with happiness itself then alone can all errors cease when i am one with knowledge itself and this is the necessary scientific conclusion science has proved to me that physical individuality is a delusion that really my body is one little continuously changing body in an unbroken ocean of matter and advaita 
is the necessary conclusion with my other counterpart soul science is nothing but the finding of unity as soon as science would reach perfect unity it would stop from further progress because it would reach the goal thus chemistry could not progress farther when it would discover one element of which all others could be made physics would stop when it would be able to fulfill its services in discovering one energy of which all the others are but manifestations and the science of religion becomes perfect when it would discover him who is the one life in a universe of death him who is the constant basis of an ever changing world one who is the only soul of which all souls are but delusive manifestations thus is it through multiplicity and duality that the ultimate unity is reached religion can go no farther this is the goal of all science all science is bound to come to this conclusion in the long run manifestation and not creation is the word of science today and the hindu is only glad that what he has been cherishing in his bosom for ages is going to be taught in more forcible language and with further light from the latest conclusions of science descend we now from the aspirations of philosophy to the religion of the ignorant at the very outset i may tell you that there is no polytheism in india in every temple if one stands by and listens one will find the worshippers applying all the attributes of god including omnipresence to the images it is not polytheism nor would the name henotheism explain the situation the rose called by any other name would smell as sweet names are not explanations I remember as a boy hearing a Christian missionary preach to a crowd in India among other sweet things he was telling them was that if he gave a blow to their idol with his stick what could it do one of his hearers sharply answered if i abuse your god what can he do you would be punished said the preacher when you die so my idol will punish you when you die retorted the hindu the tree is known by its fruits when i have seen amongst them that are called idolaters men the like of whom in morality and spirituality and love I have never seen anywhere I stop and ask myself can sin beget holiness superstition is a great enemy of man but bigotry is worse why does a christian go to church why is the cross holy why is the face turned towards the sky in prayer Why are there so many images in the Catholic Church? Why are there so many images in the minds of Protestants when they pray? My brethren, we can do more think about anything 
without a mental image, then we can live without breathing. By the law of association, the material image calls up the mental idea and vice versa. This is why the Hindu uses an external symbol when he worships. He will tell you, it helps to keep his mind fixed on the being to whom he prays. He knows as well as you do that the image is not God, is not omnipresent. Finer all, how much does omnipresence mean to almost the whole world? It stands merely as a word, a symbol. Has God superficial area? If not, when we repeat the word omnipresent, we think of the extended sky or of space. That is all. As we find that somehow or the other, by the laws of our mental constitution, we have to associate our ideas of infinity with the image of the blue sky or of the sea or we naturally connect our idea of holiness with the image of a church, a mosque or a cross. The Hindus have associated the ideas of holiness, purity, truth, omnipresence and such other ideas with different images and forms. But with this difference, that while some people devote their whole lives to their idol of a church and never rise higher, because with them, religion means an intellectual assent to certain doctrines and doing good to their fellows, the whole religion of Hindu is centered in realization. Man is to become divine by realizing the divine. Idols or temples or churches or books are only the supports, the helps of his spiritual childhood. But on and on he must progress. He must not stop anywhere. External worship, material worship, say the scriptures, is the lowest stage, struggling to rise high. Mental prayer is the next stage. But the highest stage is when the Lord has been realized. Mark, the same earnest man who is kneeling before the idol, tells you, Him the sun cannot express, nor the moon, nor the stars. The lightning cannot express Him, nor what we speak of as fire. Through Him they shine. But He does not abuse anyone's idol, or call its worship sin. He recognizes in it a necessary stage of life. The child is father of the man. Would it be right for an old man to say that childhood is a sin or youth a sin? If a man can realize his divine nature with the help of an image, would it be right to call that a sin? Nor even when he has passed that stage, should he call it an error. To the Hindu, man is not traveling from error to truth, but from truth to truth, from lower to higher truth. To him, all the religions from the lowest fetishism to the highest 
absolutism means so many attempts of the human soul to grasp and realize the infinite each determined by the conditions of its birth and association and each of these marks a stage of progress and every soul is a young eagle soaring higher and higher gathering more and more strength till it reaches the glorious sun unity in variety is the plan of nature and the hindu has recognized it every other religion lays down certain fixed dogmas and tries to force society to adopt them it places before society only one coat which must fit jack and john and henry all alike if it does not fit john or henry he must go without a coat to cover his body the hindus have discovered that the absolute can only be realized or thought of or stated through the relative and the images crosses and crescents are simply so many symbols so many pegs to hang spiritual ideas on it is not that this help is necessary for everyone but those that do not need it have no right to say that it is wrong nor is it compulsory in hinduism one thing i must tell you idolatry in india does not mean anything horrible it is not the mother of harlots on the other hand it is the attempt of undeveloped minds to grasp high spiritual truths the hindus have their faults they sometimes have their exceptions but mark this they are always for punishing their own bodies and never for cutting the throats of their neighbors if the hindu fanatic burns himself on the pyre he never lights the fire of inquisition and even this cannot be laid at the door of his religion any more than the burning of witches can be laid at the door of christianity to the hindu then the whole world of religions is only a traveling a coming up of different men and women through various conditions and circumstances to the same goal every religion is only evolving a god out of the material man and the same god is the inspirer of all of them why then are there so many contradictions they are only apparent says the hindu the contradictions come from the same truth adapting itself to the varying circumstances of different natures it is the same light coming through glasses of different colors and these little variations are necessary for purposes of adaptation but in the heart of everything the same truth reigns the lord has declared to the hindu in his incarnation as krishna i am in every religion as the thread through a string of pearls 
wherever thou sees extraordinary holiness an extraordinary power raising and purifying humanity know thou that i am there and what has been the result i challenge the world to find throughout the whole system of sanskrit philosophy any such expression as that the hindu alone will be saved and not others says vyasa we find perfect men even beyond the pale of our caste and creed one thing more how then can the hindu whose whole fabric of thought centers in god believe in buddhism which is agnostic or in jainism which is atheistic the buddhists or the jains do not depend upon god but the whole force of their religion is directed to the great central truth in every religion to evolve a god out of man they have not seen the father but they have seen the son and he that had seen the son had seen the father also this brethren is a short sketch of the religious ideas of the hindus the hindu may have failed to carry out all his plans but if there is ever to be a universal religion it must be one which will have no location in place or time which will be infinite like the god it will preach and whose sun will shine upon the followers of krishna and of christ on saints and sinners alike which will not be brahmanic or buddhistic christian or mohammedan but the sum total of all of these and still have infinite space for development which in its catholicity will embrace in infinite arms and find a place for every human being from the lowest groveling savage not far removed from the brute to the highest man towering by the virtues of his head and heart almost above humanity making society stand in awe of him and doubt his human nature it will be a religion which will have no place for persecution or intolerance in its polity which will recognize divinity in every man and woman and whose whole scope whose whole force will be centered in aiding humanity to realize its own true divine nature offer such a religion and all the nations will follow you ashoka's council was a council of the buddhist faith akbar's though more to the purpose was only a parlor meeting it was reserved for america to proclaim to all quarters of the globe that the lord is in every religion may he who is the brahman of the hindus the ahura mazda of the zoroastrians the buddha of the buddhists the jehova of the jews the father in heaven of the christians give strength to you to carry out your noble idea the star arose in the east 
it traveled steadily towards the west sometimes dimmed and sometimes effulgent till it made a circuit of the world and now it is again rising on the very horizon of the east the borders of the sanpo a thousand fold more effulgent than it ever was before hail colombia motherland of liberty it has been given to thee who never dipped her hand in her neighbor's blood who never found out that the shortest way of becoming rich was by robbing one's neighbors it has been given to thee to march at the vanguard of civilization with the flag of harmony dhuni lo bhano madhuro gumbhiro prabhato amboro majhe dike digontore bhubano mundire shanti shungito baje dhuni lo re dhuni lo re Christianity must always be ready for good criticism and I think you will hardly mind if I make a little criticism Christian brethren of America you are so fond of sending out missionaries to save the souls of the heathens I ask you what have you done and are doing to save their bodies from starvation in india there are 300 million men and women living on an average of a little more than 50 cents a month i have seen them living for years upon wild flowers during the terrible famines thousand died from hunger but the missionaries did nothing they come and offer life but only on condition that the hindus become christians abandoning the faith of their fathers and forefathers is it right 
there are hundreds of asylums but if the muslims or the hindus go there they are kicked out there are thousands of asylums erected by hindus where anybody is received there are hundreds of churches that have been erected with the assistance of hindus but no hindu temples for which a christian has given a penny brethren of america you erect churches all through india but the crying evil in the east is not religion they have religion enough but it is bread that the suffering millions of burning india cry out for with parched throats what they want is bread but they are given a stone it is an insult to starving people to offer them religion it is an insult to a starving man to teach him metaphysics therefore if you wish to illustrate the meaning of brotherhood treat the hindus more kindly even though they are hindus and are faithful to their religion send missionaries to teach them how better to earn a piece of bread and not to teach them metaphysical nonsense the earlier speaker said something about the miserable and ignorant priests in china the same may be said of the priests in india i am one of those monks who have been described as beggarly that is the pride of my life i am proud in that sense to be christ like i eat what i have today and think not of tomorrow behold the lilies of the field they toil not neither do they spin the hindu carries that out literally any gentleman present in chicago sitting at this platform can testify that for the last 12 years i never knew whence my next meal would come I am proud to be a beggar for the sake of the Lord. The idea in the East is that to preach or teach anything for the sake of money is low and vulgar. But to teach the name of the Lord for pay is such degradation as would cause the priest to lose caste and be spat upon. There is one suggestion in the earlier speaker's paper that is true. If the priests of China and India were organized, there is an enormous amount of potential energy that could be used for regeneration of society and humanity. I endeavored to organize it in India but failed for the lack of money. it may be i shall get the help i want in america i came here to seek help for my impoverished people and i fully realized how difficult it was to get help for heathens from christians in a christian land i have heard so much of this land of freedom of liberty and freedom of thought that i am not discouraged i thank you ladies and gentlemen yeah apni chhab bana ke so me gai piya ke pa de
देखी पीहू की सो मो मन भया उदास वो से नैना मिलाए गए छाप तिलक सब चीनी रे मो से नैना मिलाए गए छाप तिलक सब जब कह दीरे मोसे नैना मिलाए गे बात अजब कह दीरे मोसे I am not a Buddhist, as you have heard, and yet I am. If China and Japan and Sri Lanka follow the teachings of the Buddha, India worships him as God incarnate on Earth. You have just now heard that I am going to criticize Buddhism, but by that. I wish you to understand only this Far be it from me to criticize him whom I worship as God incarnate on earth Our view about Buddha is that he was not understood properly by his disciples The relation between Hinduism by Hinduism I mean the religion of the Vedas and what is called buddhism at the present day is nearly the same as between judaism and christianity jesus christ was a jew and shakya muni buddha was a hindu the jews rejected jesus christ nay crucified him whereas the hindus accept shakya muni as god incarnate and worship him but the real difference that we hindus want to show between modern buddhism 
and what we should understand as the teachings of Buddha lies principally in this. Shakya Muni came to preach nothing new. Like Jesus, the Buddha came to fulfill and not to destroy. In the case of Jesus, it was the old people, the Jews, who did not understand him. While in the case of the Buddha, it was his own followers who did not realize the import of his teachings. As the Jew did not understand the fulfillment of the Old Testament, so the Buddhist did not understand the fulfillment of the truths of the Hindu religion. Again, I repeat, Shakya Muni came not to destroy, but he was the fulfillment, the logical conclusion, the logical development of the religion of the Hindus. The religion of the Hindus is divided into two parts, the ceremonial and the spiritual. The spiritual portion is specially studied by the monks. In it, there is no caste. In India, a man from the highest caste and a man from the lowest can become monks. Thus the two castes become equal. In religion, there is no caste. Caste is simply a social institution. Shakya Muni himself was a monk and it was his glory that he had the large-heartedness to bring out the truths hidden in the Vedas and through them broadcast all over the world. He was the first being in the world who brought missionaries into practice. Nay, he was the first to conceive the idea of proselytizing. The great glory of the Master lay in his wonderful sympathy for everybody, especially for the ignorant and the poor. Some of his disciples were Brahmins. When Buddha was teaching, Sanskrit was no more the spoken language in India. It was then only in the books of the learned. Some of Buddha's Brahmin disciples wanted to translate his teachings into Sanskrit. But he distinctively told them, I am for the poor, for the people. Let me speak in the tongue of the people. And so, to this day, the great bulk of his teachings are in the vernacular of that day in India. Whatever may be the position of philosophy, whatever may be the position of metaphysics, so long as there is such a thing as death in the world, so long as there is such a thing as weakness in the human heart, so long as there is a cry going out of the human heart, there shall be faith in God. On the philosophic side, the disciples of the great master dash themselves against the eternal rocks of the Vedas and could not crush them. And on the other side, they took away from the nation that eternal God to which everyone, man or woman, clings so fondly. And the result was that Buddhism had to die a natural death in India. At the present day, there are very few who call themselves Buddhists in India, 
the land where Buddhism was born. But at the same time, Hinduism lost something, that reforming zeal, that wonderful sympathy and charity for everybody, that wonderful leaven which Buddhism had brought to the masses and which had rendered Indian society so great that a Greek historian who wrote about India of that time was led to say that no Hindu was known to tell an untruth and no Hindu woman was known to be unchaste. Hinduism cannot live without Buddhism nor Buddhism without Hinduism. Then realize what the separation has shown to us. That the Buddhist cannot stand without the brain and philosophy of the Hindu, nor the Hindu without the heart of the Buddhist. This separation between Buddhists and Hindus is the cause of the downfall of India. That is why India is populated by 300 millions of beggars and that is why India has been the slave of conquerors for the last thousand years. Let us then join the wonderful intellect of the Hindus with the heart, the noble soul, the wonderful humanizing power of the Buddha. Nahi Shurujo, Nahi Jyoti, Nahi Shashanko, Shundaro. Bhashe Pyo Me Chaya Shomu, Bhashe Pyo Me Chaya Shomu. Chobi Bishu Chara Choro Nahi Shurujo Nahi Jyoti Asphuto mono akashe Asphuto mono akashe Jagoto shangsharo bhaashe उठे भाषे डोबे पुनु उठे भाषे डोबे पुनु अहुं स्रोते निरं Shadharao, 
সে ধারা বদ্ধ হল শূন্যে শূন্য মেলাইল অবাঙ্গমান সুচর বুঝে প্রাণ বুঝে জ্যোতি নাহি শশাঙ্ক সুন্দর ভাষে প্রমে ছায়া ছবি বিশ্ব ছড়া 